Father, we ask, uh, would you remind us that we are your children? Lord, would you help us to hear your voice? Lord, would you help us to preach? Would you help us to hear what your spirit is saying to your church? And Lord, help me not to go long. And remember to set my timer. So I forgot last time. So, we'll do that. Amen. Can I have an amen? So, <laughs> you can play the video, yeah. I can only imagine what that little giraffe was thinking as it flopped around on the ground, staring at the ankles of its mother and father between face plants as it learned to walk. This is impossible. Why did God give me such long legs? My neck is way too long. This thing is impossible to balance. But the little blighter must learn to walk if it is to join the herd and survive. Balancing, standing, walking, running are in its very DNA. It's built into the very fabric of her being. For this giraffe, it's not about how her spots looked or how to grow them or how to change the, change the pattern. It was not about how to grow tall. She was made to be one with the herd in which she lives and moves and has her being. Good morning, my name is John, pastor of spiritual formation and community life here at the sanctuary. This morning, I would like to stir up within you your spiritual DNA, your built-in word of life that created you, formed you, birthed you into this world, and breathed his spirit into you. I want to stir up the desire in you to be fully formed in one body of Christ and together learn to walk with the spirit as new creation. Not that not the old you entering into a new creation, but the old you dead and crucified with Christ and raised with Christ and filled with the Spirit of Christ, being built up into a body, a living temple. New Jerusalem, where heaven and earth become one, new creation. This is the longing of the Father. This is the longing of the Son. This is the longing of the Spirit. This is the longing of all creation. And this is the longing of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the Galatians. Now, I can't unpack the whole letter of Galatians, but I'm going to do a, a bit of a survey. But we're going to start in the middle so that we get the main core of what Paul was doing with the rest of Galatians. In Galatians 4.19, we read this curious phrase, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Wait a sec. Christ formed in you? What does that mean? Is it like a copy? Is it the original? Does, does Jesus start out kind of mushy and then grow solid? Does he start out small and then grow large? Does he start out, start out immature and then matures? But he's already fully mature and perfect in every way. So how, how does the whole thing of maturity make sense? We'll wonder, if you will, how the living God, the eternally begotten Son of the Father, became an actual human and had to experience full humanity with all its limitations and growth growing in stature and wisdom with God and man. 
He started out immature, growing in step with the Spirit until he reached full maturity. Then going the next step in, into loving obedience unto death, he offers up his life on the cross, dies, and is raised with a new kind of bodily life that can walk through walls, teleport, ascend into heaven, and is with us always, transcending time and space. This is the same Jesus who said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. It has always been the Father's intention that Jesus would be the firstborn among many brothers. I would say and sisters, but that indicates an ongoing gender distinction that I'm not sure exists, will exist for us in the resurrection, in the new bodies we will have. But whether they're male and female or, 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 or both or, or, or neither, whatever form they have, it will be gloriously far above these present bodies as much as a tree is far above what a little seed looks like. It'll be amazing. The universe will be our playground and our workshop. Whatever that looks like, when Christ appears, we will be like him. So how will this transformation happen? Not only for the physical bodies in the resurrection, because I don't know what that looks like, but internally, how does that transformation happen? What part of this transformation is God's work? And what part of this is our work? Some water. Now, did you notice that even in that question, I made a major assumption and a critical error. I totally separated God's work from my work. God's actions from my actions. God's walk from my walk. God's being for my being. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The Spirit of Christ abides in you. The Holy Spirit, the giver of life, is in your spirit. God has made God's self one of us. There is not God's part over here and my part over there. Not thee and me, but this union of Christ and me the Father in Christ, Christ in me, one in the Spirit. What shall we call this union that is more than just us? It's a new thing, a new type of being, a new creation. I cannot speak of God there and me here, God doing me doing this and God doing that. What pronoun shall I use for this new reality? To borrow from Ma Martin Laird in his book, Into the Silent Land, at some point we stop experiencing God's presence as you and me as separate things, two neighbors who get along, and we move into a shared identity. And with a little tongue in cheek, it is thou. There is no part of me that Christ has not laid claim to inhabit. No part where he says, you're on your own, kid. I'll be waiting over there. We see this in Paul in Galatians 2, 19 to 20. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. Yet it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, I'm dead, but I'm alive. But it's not me living in me, it's Christ living in me. And even though I'm dead, it's, it's me living in Christ. The, we just don't have words for this, even, even after 2,000 years. We're still struggling for language. Or in other words, it is thou. Our faith in Christ is a gift that is birthed and flows continually by the faithfulness of Christ. Verse 16. The two cannot be separated. Until I am reciprocating that faith of Christ in me, I am still living my life, isolated from God and the people of God. According to N.T. Wright, 
which I hope you tune in for Surprised by Hope, uh, who I dove into his commentary on Galatians for this message. He's an esteemed scholar, pastor, and Anglican bishops. Galatians is not how one gets individually saved and goes to heaven when they die. It's not this debate between faith and works that, was, that it was turned into into the 16th century during the Reformation. Galatians is about how the Messiah in you, not only individually, but as Paul states, with, as Paul is stating with his own case, but corporately, as people of the Messiah, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, nor male or female, male and female. So why all this anguish of Christ being formed in you for this community? Isn't Paul the great evangelist? Isn't he called to get individuals to, you know, say a prayer confessing faith in Jesus as personal Savior who died for their sins? How, how he suffered God's punishment in their place and, and now they're assured of going to heaven? Is, isn't that what Paul's supposed to be doing? He's an evangelist, right? Wasn't that the gospel Paul preached? Wasn't that what Paul meant when he said he boasts in the cross? Well, let's let Paul answer that. Let's turn to the beginning of this letter to the Galatians. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. So why did Jesus die on the cross? He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. This isn't some angry judge. This is the very heart of the Father to deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus, the Messiah, gave himself to deliver us from this present evil age. In love, in the love of the Father. In other words, there's something about our sins that keeps us captive to this present evil age. It is the will of our our God and Father to deliver us. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to save us from his present evil age. It was not for God to balance the scales of human, a human version of justice that demands its pound of flesh. Retributive justice is a man-made thing, and it's part of this present evil age. Our God and Father sent the Messiah to rescue us from captivity to the spiritual forces of darkness and the depraved, dehumanizing behavior that our sin and the sins of others and our corporate social sins in which the whole world operates, these have all trapped and imprisoned us. We need to be set free from this present evil age. And that's why Jesus died. I have been crucified with Christ. The life I now live today, here in this body, here in, this, in the midst of this present evil age, I'll now live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This was in fulfillment of the Father's love for me. And they are one. Their wills are one. Their love is one. God's Spirit is joined to my life, responding in faith that flows from the faith of Christ. This flow of faith from God to Christ in me back to God. This thouness not God up there and me down here, but Christ in me and I in Christ, spiritually conjoined as one body. One spirit is growing, emerging, maturing. Not in my professing and atonement theory of how it all works, as much fun as that is to dig into, and I geek out on that, but Christ's faithfulness welling up from within Christ in me. For from the from our union and crying, Abba, Father. Well, this cry of Abba, Father, is that me? Is that Christ in me? Is that the Spirit? Yes, (laughs) it is thou. Jesus, John's Spirit, the beloved of God, 
I'm learning to walk as new creation, the promised age to come breaking into this present evil age. And so what we're praying when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, it's happening right here and right now. Dimitri, <laughs> our Father sent the Messiah to deliver you from this present evil age. You have been crucified with Christ. The I you knew no longer lives. The life you now live is by faith of Christ who loves you and gave himself for you to fulfill God's love and will for you. You are a new creation in Christ. You are no longer just you. It is thou. Mindy, our Father sent the Messiah to deliver you from this present evil age. You have been crucified with Christ. The I you knew no longer lives. The life you now live by faith of Christ who loves you and gave himself for you to fulfill God's love and will for you. You are a new creation in Christ. You are no longer just you. It is thou. Now here's the kicker. It's not thou and 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 thou. We are thou, a new humanity. We are one body of Christ, with Christ as the head. We, this is thou. Christ being formed in each of us individually, Christ being formed in us collectively. Not to whisk us off to heaven before the earth implodes under the weight of spiritual captivity, but to come down and rescue it from within. New creation. We hear this, this promise in Luke. And in the same region were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. New creation does not grow out of the gradual improvement of the old. The knee of every captive soul of humanity must bow and willingly die with Christ so that they might finally and fully be set free into the fullness of his resurrection. As in Adam all die, so in Christ the second Adam, all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15.22 this is the great rescue. This is the new humanity, this one magnificent body and bride of Christ for which all creation groans that we read about in Romans 8. Spiritual formation is not just the formation of Christ in me and you individually. The Great Commission has always been about making disciples, making apprentices of Jesus, learning from Jesus how to walk in the Spirit, learning to walk in his communion with the Father, just as Jesus walked in communion with the Father. Learning to love, walk in love and peace with one another, forgiving offenses and restoring one another. All the while, he is making us one. Learning to walk in love for our neighbor as we walk in love for ourselves. Learning to walk into injustice and even into death, laying down our lives in love learning to walk in the faithfulness of Christ, not just in our minds, not just in our emotions, but rooted and grounded deep, deep down, walking in step with the indwelling Holy Spirit, learning to walk as one body of Christ as part of the first fruits of the new creation. Well, Jesus is the first fruit, but we're being grafted into his fruitfulness. We are new creation walking. In chapter 4 of Galatians, Paul warns us that the enslaved captive parts of us, the church, the world, will persecute those who in the freedom of the Spirit of the Son are crying, Abba, Father. Stand firm and do not be, become enslaved again to the religious works of the flesh that seek to appease God and avoid polit political persecution by virtue signaling with circumcision. 
The mark of being a true heir of the Abrahamic promise, Paul argues, is not a faith in circumcision, but the faithfulness of Jesus, the Messiah, the true Son of Israel. Do not again submit to the yoke of slavery in order to avoid persecution. Outward religious signs to appease the social and political powers out of fear of persecution will keep you from walking in the new creation. And here's where a little bit of history comes in. For the Galatial Gentile Christians, the pressure was on them to be circumcised to ensure that the Jesus believers, the Jesus followers, those proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, fell under protection of the law that the Jews had to be exempt from offering sacrifices to other gods, including Caesar. Everybody else had to offer these sacrifices, except for the Jews. They were exempt because they had paid through centuries of blood saying, no, we will not sacrifice to other gods. And the new Christians viewed themselves as Jews. This, this faithfulness to the one God is as heirs of Abraham through their faith in Christ. And they viewed themselves as exempt. But the fear was, if you're not circumcised, if you're not practicing some of the major Jewish customs, you're going to lose that status, that protective status. And we could come under persecution because we won't sacrifice to Caesar. And they're saying, well, you don't have to practice the whole of Torah, just enough to get along and not draw attention of the Roman authorities and our non-believing Jewish community. At the heart of our community was not the belief that Jesus was the, at the heart of our community, um, they had something other than the belief that Jesus was the promised Messiah, whose death, resurrection, and ascension was ushered in the age to come. But instead they had a virtue signal of keeping Torah, circumcision, some of the diet, and observing Sabbath. So you don't have to keep the whole law. Just don't let belief that Jesus is the culmination of fulfillment through whom the promised age to come rock the boat too much. That this tentative peace that we have with Rome to practice our religion without persecution. We really sort of like things the way they are even though we wish the Romans would leave, we're learning to get along, coping as best we can. The outward signs of keeping Torah have replaced the work of Torah. The work of Torah was to bring us to the limits of Torah. I have, through the law, I have died to the law, as Paul says. So to bring us to the limits of Torah and birth us through death and resurrection out of captivity into the promised new life of the kingdom. But our ambition is not to strive for how to help the old captive cope with its captivity, but to become new creation walking, walking in the newness and freedom and life of Christ. If your devotion to God is powered by your flesh, driven by fear, force, and coercion, you will be at war with the life of the Spirit in you. The same fear that causes you to virtue signal will lead you further into captivity to this present evil age and keep you from being new creation walking. We see this pouring all throughout Galatians. Galatians 5, 16 to 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things you, from keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Verses uh, continuing. The works of the flesh break out in all kinds of dehumanizing, dehumanizing ways against others. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Yeah. Danger, Will Robinson. You are breathing in soul, a soul-eating virus. This Paul says, these things are self-evident. It, you cannot play appeasement games with this present evil age without entering once again into slavery. You will not be able to see, let alone walk in your inheritance in the kingdom. You will not experience the rule and reign of God in your life. And that is, where what God wants done is done. That is one's kingdom, where what, where what one wants done is done. This is not a punishment. It is the poison fruit of the flesh. That part of your soul programming must die. It has no place in the kingdom of God. Not now and not in the age to come. So avoid sowing sowing into these desires and avoid empowering those who practice them. Don't give them your time and attention. Don't increase their influence on social media with your clicks, likes, applause, and admiration. On the contrary, practice sowing to the fruit of the Spirit. Follow those who have it. Learn from them. Galatians 5, 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, of course there's no law against them. All humanity, all societies, they want these. They admire these things. Well, at least they admire them in others. We sort of like our neighbor to have them. They just aren't willing to die to themselves so that it can be formed in them. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucify our passions. Oy! Can't we just, you know, sort of like just ease out of them a little bit at a time? Just mix in a little virtue, fake it till we make it, just cheer it on in others and give them two enthusiastic thumbs up on Facebook? Well, how's that working for you? If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Shaming and virtue signaling? Not helping. Paul urges us, beginning with Galatians 6, 1 to 3. Brothers, If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him with the spirit of gentleness. Not shaming. (laughs) Well, the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. covering up your vanity and self-aggrandizement through virtue signaling. It's so effective at fooling others. No one will notice. I don't even notice it in myself anymore. If you want to be a new creation walking, I can't just cover up my flesh. I need to crucify it. I did not say I need to crucify your flesh or their flesh. That would only increase fear, force, and coercion and basically just adding gasoline to the flesh fire. It would only serve as a diversion to direct attention away from me and outrage onto you. Well, those are the times in which we live, aren't they? Be gentle with yourselves. I mean that seriously. Be gentle with yourself, even as you're crucifying yourself. I can only crucify my flesh as I respond to the love of God in Christ to deliver me from this present evil age. Fear and shame-based cross-bearing will only imprison you further. Pick up your cross and follow me is an invitation given in love. 
for deliverance from this present evil age and into the freedom of the heirs living in the kingdom of God. We have to bear the load of our own cross, each of us. So be gentle with others too. It's not an easy thing to die. Galatians 4, 6, Galatians 6, 4 to 5. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. It's usually pretty easy to be gentle and die to desire to give a piece of my mind until someone lets their desire to give a piece of their mind just rip and start blasting away. And God says, no, John. I said, Ooh, it's not fair. They get the spot off. I, I can't just let that go unanswered. God, we can't just let that go unanswered. John, you can't fight the flesh with flesh and expect to inherit the kingdom of heaven in this area. Crucify that desire to give a piece of your mind. Rise with me and give them a piece of my spirit instead. They are captive to evil forces inflicting them with fear and shame. They are, cap- they are captive to evil forces puffing them up with pride and power. They are captive to evil forces constantly reminding them that their life, livelihood, and health could be taken from them at any instant. They don't need you to fix them. They don't need you to set them straight. They don't need you to shame, coerce, and force them to do the right thing. John, they need me. So ask of me, Lord, what do you want me to give them in this present moment? A piece of my love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Maybe an example of self-control. So I ask, Lord, what do you want to sow into them together? New creation walking sees pain, gives blessing, and sows the Spirit. Do not envy, envy them for acting out in their fleshliness, deceiving themselves that they are pulling one over on God and getting away with something. God isn't mocked. We will all sow what we reap until we can stomach it no more and turn and repent and ask for the Lord to deliver us. But as for you, John, as for you, people of God, sow to the Spirit and to the fountain of our communion the Lord's divine eternal life is flowing out of your innermost being. Do not grow weary of doing good, even if evil is thrown at you in return. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. Hear the call of Jesus, take up your cross and follow me. We will sow and reap of the Spirit together, not only in your life, but in the lives of everyone you touch. New creation walking. With Paul we can say, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So there's usually an underlying motive when people get religious, some underlying gain. Far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision but a new creation. The love and will of our God and Father is so much greater than our individual heavenly retirement plans, and our lives are so much more than merely being cleaned up versions of the old, isolated self. This is new creation walking. It takes the spirit-filled community of Christ to form a spirit-filled member of Christ. This is making disciples. This is the great commission of our Lord. 
This is new creation walking. The discipleship of walking in step with the Spirit is not about the gradual self-improvement of Mises. Mises needs to take up its cross and follow Jesus into his death and resurrection. This is new creation walking. The discipleship of walking in step with the Spirit is not about fixing and modifying the moral behavior of others through fear, force, or coercion, through shaming, punishment, legislation, and cancel culture as methods of fear, force, and coercion will only stir up the flesh, trading one form of captivity for another. Weezes must take up its cross and follow Jesus into its death and resurrection. This is new creation walking. The Lord is never far from any of us. He comes into every hell in which we find ourselves held captive and offers up his life as a ransom. Come, die with me. My Father will raise me up, I and you, and you and me, and the Father and me in you. In Christ we are one. In Christ we die to this present evil age. In Christ, we inherit the age to come. In Christ, we are new creation walking. So Lord, we come to your table. And then on the night you are betrayed, and the night as you lived a life continually sowing to the Spirit, sowing the Spirit unto us, he took bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it saying, take eat, this is my body given for you. And often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup. This is my blood poured out in the new covenant given for the remission of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus came to deliver us from this present evil age. And this was his memorial meal that night when he was to be betrayed and enter into death for all humanity, for every person who ever has lived or will live. The blue cups are juice, the brown cups are wine, both are the blood of Christ. Take a piece of bread, dip it, well, that's a big piece. And ingest it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. New creation walking. So, Lord, we come. We come to where you already are, into the inner sanctuary, into the Holy of Holies, where your Spirit breathes in us. Jesus, where you are present, drawing us into the very communion and life of the Father. So I bless you. I bless you the awareness of the presence of God. I bless you with the desire to have Christ formed in you individually and in your families and in your marriages, in your place of work and with your neighbors, that with every place you touch, you would sow the Spirit with patience and gentleness and hope but in this quiet confidence that God will be all in all. All the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord, and someday we will all see it. 
and all of creation awaits that day, that glorious promise for the children of God to be revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen.